Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to call, uh, call to you to, uh, to worship this morning. Our scripture will be Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern so that you may discern what is good, pleasing in, per, in the perfect will of God. I read to you Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. We ask that you stand today as we enter into worship. We serve a great God, great God, Jehovah. And he is worthy of all our praise. You may see some different faces up here today. We have not gotten rid of Little Bell's praise team. Um, those that are concerned, we are just trying to give them a little rest today. So we ask some friends and family to come by and just help out today. And we worship the Lord together because he's a great God. So today we ask that you worship great Jehovah today.
bless you, Jesus. Only you, Lord. Only you, Lord. It's all about you, God. Jesus.
everyone. Such great singing from the praise team. Beautiful songs, beautiful voices. Thanks, praise team, for that great selection that you have given. Praise the Lord. But um, I'm up here to worship in our giving. That's another way that we can worship is through our giving. And I'm reading from 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, the 12th through the 14th verse. And it reads thus, For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, the 14th verse, but by you, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. Now, it's three principles out of these scriptures that I am going to give, and these principles are for Christian living. I'll say that again. These principles are for Christian living. The first one is give from the willingness of your mind, which is your heart. Equally give back to the Lord. The second one is give in proportion to what you have. The larger that you have, the most amount that you have, you would give back the greater portion that you can give back to help others. And the third principle from the scripture is say give from the love that you supply everyone's need. As you give to them, they will give back to you. The Lord will give back to you. So God wants us to meet each other's need. He want me to meet you all need and he want you all to meet my need. So this is a, a corporate thing that we should be meeting each other need in the setting of the church. Even outside of the church, we should be meeting the needs of the peace, people. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Lord, you are the master of the universe. We just continue, dear Father, to look to the hills from whence cometh our help. And we know that our help is coming from you, almighty God. So Father God, we just pray for the tithes that is given today. That as people open up their hands and give freely back to you what you have given unto them, dear Lord, that we will continue to give to help other people. Help those who are poor. Help those who are needy, dear Lord. And we just thank and praise you for the means that you have given us, the portion that you have, proportion that you have given us to help others, dear Lord. So, Father God, I just pray that as we continue in this service, dear Father, that we will uh, take heed to your word and hear what thus says the Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. can't make it back up on that stage yet. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Walter Reese, and I'm here to uh, share in corporate prayer with us all. We bow our heads. Father God, I come to you this morning, thanking you for waking us all up this morning, waking us up for another day. Thank you for being such a forgiving Father, forgiving us daily for sins of thought, sins of action, that friends, family members may not know about, but you surely do. Father, thank you for the daily reminder that Jesus Christ was obedient unto death. We all need to confess that at the smallest inconvenience or hardship or denial of pleasure involved, we quickly turn away from what pleases you. Oftentimes, the effort of trying to understand whether or not something is your will is too much for us, Father God. Please forgive us. 
Help us. Create a desire in us to change so that we might have hearts that are responsive, not to the world, not to our flesh, but to your word, to your will. Lord, there are members of this body sitting here today, visitors and members as well who are watching service right now, dealing with sins known and unknown. Please forgive them. Forgive us in this moment, Lord. Help us to do better, for the Father God, especially when we know better. We lift your name on high, thanking you for the grace and mercy that you provide to us, which none of us deserve. Lord, thank you for the reminder in 2 Peter 1.3, as you tell us that we have everything we need in you. Help us to fully understand what that means, Father God. Help us to fully understand that you, the great I am, you have already made provisions for all of our needs. Lord, you continue to keep your promise while we sin daily and think we're safe. Help us to be safe and exercise wise judgment, Father God, during this pandemic that has not subsided. Lord, there are so many other things going on in this world today, foreign, domestic, not to mention in our local issues here in Inkster and even in our neighborhood, Father God. Lord, please use the faithful few, the faithful few to make faithful many, Father God, to spread your word and make more disciples to win the souls of your children who are lost sliding or just may need that extra boost by that extra encouragement to get back to doing your work. Lord, please be with the members of the congregation who are in need, whether they're here in person or watching. You know what their needs are, whether it's physical, financial, family issues, work issues, or spiritual need. Oh God, we pray that you would, by your grace, reveal our neediness to us and reveal it to friends and family so that they can help us in our times of need. Reveal to us your fullness and your faithfulness. I pray that you, that your perfect love expel all fear, doubt, anxiety, and worry from anyone with an earshot of my voice. When we think about all that you are doing through, your, uh, through our youth here at NBC and just on this corner, being a beacon for others, Father God. Lord, I pray that more Christians stand in the gap and fight for what is right and true according to your word. Help us, Lord, to defend the faith and not to cower to Satan's foolishness. Help us to always remember to give you all the glory and reverence in all that we do and say daily. It is through that we exist. Thank you again, Father, for your grace and mercy. In your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The next voice that you will hear is from Pastor Tim Patterson, our guest pastor, uh, following um, Khalil sharing a, a, a word. Father, uh, pastor Tim is a national mobilizer of the North American Mission Board and our executive director of the Baptist State Convention of Michigan. Pastor Patterson holds an undergrad degree from Criswell College in Dallas and a Master of Divinity from the Southern Baptist School of Biblical Studies in Jacksonville, Florida. He studied at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas as well. Pastor Tim has been married to his wife, Sabrina, for 40 plus years. I'm sure he'll give us the exact number. I'm 46, maybe? He'll, he'll let us know. They have two sons and five grandchildren. After Khalil shares, again, the next voice you hear for the preach word is Pastor Tim Patterson. Good morning, church. I will now read to you the sermon title, which is Paul's Prayer. The scripture is Philippians 1, verses 9 through 11. And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Thank you. Well, good morning, Middle Bell. How you doing? Y'all look good. Thank you, Pastor Larry. If you're watching or listening, maybe you're just laying on the beach somewhere. I hope you're getting some rest. 
Those who are watching on uh, through via, via internet, welcome to Middle Belt Baptist Church. Middle Belt Baptist Church. Hope you uh, have a great day in our Lord today. I'm Tim Patterson, your executive director, and it's a privilege and an honor to be in this pulpit. I love Larry. He is a phenomenal preacher and pastor. Uh, wish we had many, many more like him. I love to hear him preach. He's just a great expositor of the word. And so I am a little intimidated by being in his pulpit today. But if you would, take your Bibles and turn to Philippians. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. As you've read that scripture just read, let me share with you again that scripture. It says, and I pray this, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Hey, wasn't that praise team good this morning? I, 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 did, I, I, did, I thought they were from here, but I think they're just... Raise praise friends. I don't know who are there, but guys, thank you for coming. In fact, if you'd like to come with me every Sunday, I'd, I'd appreciate it wherever I go. Man, that just grease the skids and let me get out of there. <laughs> if you can't preach after that, you're in trouble. The book of Philippians, what a book of joy. Folks, if we, if we ever needed joy, don't we need it today? I mean, we've been dealing with so much over the last two years. It just seems like the, the very gates of hell have opened up and belched itself out in our midst. And we've been having to deal with so much, from the pandemic to the racial issues to the, uh, to the wars to the, uh, all of the junk of this world. Philippi was not much different than that. They were dealing with all kinds of things. They were having all kinds of battles. And here was this young church under this young pastor, Timothy, and Paul is writing to him and saying, now listen, it, 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 is, it doesn't matter what goes on around you. It's not your happenstances that make you happy. It's the joy that resides within you that matters. And he talks about joy, rejoice, rejoice, find joy in this throughout the book of Philippians. So if you want to find great joy and great peace in God, read the book of Philippians. It will encourage you. It will give you great joy. And he starts out, he says, I, I'm praying this for you. Now, this is a, this is a, a seasoned pastor, apostle, who's giving a word of prayer for a church that he cares deeply about and a young pastor. Now, if there's ever a prayer that we need to emulate as a church, as an individual, it's this prayer this morning. I prayed for a lot of people over my, over my many years of ministry and uh, for 47 years of marriage, by the way. Uh, I, I, I've prayed for many people, and many have come to me as a pastor and said, would you pray for me? <laughs> One particular Sunday, it wasn't me, but another pastor, a, a fellow came in the back door, and you could tell by the way he was walking that he was slightly inebriated. And as he kind of wandered and wobbled down the aisle, he came down right to where the pastor was. And he looked up and said, oh, Pastor, will you pray for me? The pastor said, yes, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. And so he, he came up and he, he said, stood right there by him. The pastor put his arm around his shoulder and said, now, dear Lord, will you bless this drunk? And he goes, oh, oh, don't tell him I'm drunk. Aren't we like that sometimes? When we go to God, we think he doesn't know what's going on. We think God is surprised by our stupidness sometimes. And what we do, oh, Paul's praying for a church. that God knows what's going on and God knows what they need. We need that as well. And he says, he says, I want you to have a great joy. And see, joy comes, listen, joy comes from seeing the complete fulfillment of the specific purpose for which we've been created and born. 
That's where joy comes from. And that can't be successfully done on our own choosing and doing our things. It comes from doing exactly what the will of God is in our life. That's where joy comes from. That's where we find his joy. And, and Paul begins to pray. Now look at his prayer. Verse, verse 9, he's, he says, is his prayer. He says, and this I pray. Notice what he's praying for. That your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. He's praying that we'll have an abundant godly love. Now, folks, Listen. The world's not going to know Jesus by the wonderful works you do. The world's not going to know Jesus by the miracles that happen around you. Though we think those things are cool and we like that and we like the flash of all of that. But the Bible tells us they're going to know us by our love. Folks, if we're going to reach our community for Christ, if we're going to reach Inkster, if we're going to reach the communities and counties around us, if we're going to reach the state for Christ, if we're going to reach this country, if we're going to reach this world, it's going to be because of the abundant love that flows out of us through Jesus Christ. That's where it's going to come from. And that means loving people as they are, where they are, and accepting them as they are. Oh, no, that's hard, isn't it? <laughs> I like people sometimes. <laughs> As one, fella, one pastor said, you know, you don't have to be a cannibal to get fed up with people. <laughs> sometimes it just, you know, you just kind of, there are just certain people that they're hard to love. But he says, I want you to have an abundant godly love. That word there, abundant there, in the original language, it literally, it comes from the idea of a river or ocean that overflows its banks. It overflows and begins to saturate and fill everything around it. Sabrina and I lived in Florida for 25 years before we moved to Florida. I moved from Florida to Michigan. Somebody said, yeah, well, isn't that backwards? You're supposed to be Michigan to Florida. Well, we moved from Florida to Michigan. One of the things we have in the, the weather in Florida is hurricanes. We don't have those here. And periodically, a tropical storm will blow through. In fact, one is coming up the coast right now into Florida. And when one of those tropical storms will blow in, where we were situated was up near the northeastern part where the St. John's River flowed into the ocean. Uh, amazingly, it flows north and into the ocean. And it was a big, wide area. And when those tropical storms would come, the surge of water would push, be pushed up that river and push it way up the river. And anyone living along that river, any towns along that river, for a good distance, for many, many, many miles, would get flooded. It was after such, one such storm that Sabrina and I said, let's go over to Green Cove Springs and look at the, at the area. We'd been there many times. We'd walked in the parks and played in the area. It's a beautiful area right on the river. Just, it's just a gorgeous place. When we began to drive into town, there was water everywhere. There was two foot of water throughout the streets of the town. And we went to this park where we used to go, and, oh, and it was just covered. The water had receded some, but we got out in the little park, and we walked around, and everywhere we walked, it was whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. It was just soaked. And your feet would just, just sink into that big old thick grass, and it was wet and soggy. That word. It's what he's talking about for us. He says, I want your love to be so saturating that which is around you. It just overflows. You know what it'll do when we have that kind of love? That kind of godly love that saturates everything and anything about us? It will absolutely give us a godly attitude. It'll change your attitude. God's love in us, when it permeates and saturates our soul and those around us, it will change our attitudes. I, saw, I learned something long ago, by the way, and I'll, I'll throw this in for free. No one can give you a bad attitude. Now, some of you are going, wait a minute. You don't know my wife. <laughs> Other ladies are going, you don't know my husband. He just wakes up in the morning and not get a bad attitude. No, listen. No one can give you a bad attitude. You choose the attitude you have. No, may I say, more or less, the attitude that has you. 
And if we are saturated with his love like this, if it overflows and soaks into everything about us, our attitude will be godly. We'll have a godly attitude. And you know what that'll change? It'll change our words. We'll have godly words. What we say and who we say it to and how we say it, I'm telling you, it will change. Instead of being critical, we'll be encouraging. Instead of bending the truth, we'll be truthful. There's so many things about us, the words that will come out of our mouth. People just need to hear somebody who's kind. My dad was not a greatly educated man. Eighth grade education. Worked in the oil fields of West Texas. But he was wise. And he, he, often, he often told things about how you talk to people. And he said, just be nice. Just be nice. Now, that's hard to do sometimes. I know. I, I, de- I deal with the same thing you deal with. When his love is really saturating my soul, I'm a lot nicer to everybody else I'm around. And so will you be. It it changes our attitude. It changes our words. It changes our actions. How we act. I, I mean, how we live is going to change. As I said, I was reared in West Texas in a little dusty hamlet of Kermit was the name of it. Had nothing to do with the frog. Had something to do with Roosevelt's son, I think is what it was. But it was just a flat, high, just desert place. There were jackrabbits and mesquite bushes. I often said that's where God sat down and made the rest of the world because it was flat and nothing there. It just nothing. I went to a little church there in, in uh, West Texas. Now, it was a traditional Southern Baptist church. I I noticed many of the ladies here wear hats. Well, in that church, you wore a hat, ladies, and you wore your furs, and you wore your nicest and your pearls, and men, all the men had suits and ties on. All the kids were dressed in the same way, and little girls had those big fluffy dresses and those patent leather shoes and When you went in, you went in quiet, and you sat down quietly, and everybody had their place, and everything was in place. Everything was done in order, and you knew, you didn't have to know, you could be dropped in there 20 years from now, and it would be the same order of service, doing the same thing the same way. It was nice and orderly. You knew what you were going to expect. Now, I'm not saying they weren't spiritual people. They were just very traditional and orderly. And that was during the Jesus movement, the hippie movement, back in the late 60s, early 70s. That morning, the, the church was full. The organ was playing, and everybody was singing. And it's a, a young man comes in the back door, and he had long hair, tie-dyed T-shirt, dirty jeans, and barefoot. And he came in wanting to worship. And as he walked in the back door, he he looked for a place to sit. And everybody looked at him and, "Uh uh-uh, you're not sitting by me? No. And he kept going forward. And and the the closer he got and the more people saw saw him, the buzz, you could hear it. And the little ladies in the blue and pink hair. (laughs) Their mouths agape. (gasps) Oh. You thought they were going to have a heart attack. It just, and it came closer, just on and on and on and on. Everybody just watching. He couldn't find a seat. Nobody would let him sit with him. They wouldn't move over. And finally, he just came down to the front, and the preacher was standing there, and he just sat down on the floor in front of him. Well, you'd think all the wind had been sucked out of the room by the gas. They had... <gasps> About that time, the senior deacon, he was probably 90 years old, gets up 
and starts hobbling down to the front. And you can hear them. Oh, finally, someone's going to do something about this atrocity. Oh, he's going to take care of it. He's the, he, yeah. And you can just hear him back and forth. And he gets up and he finally walks down the aisle. And he goes over and he puts his hand over on the boy's shoulder and then sits down beside him Hallelujah. and worships together. <laughs> You see, when you have abundant godly love, it'll saturate your soul and change your actions toward others. Church, you think we need more of that today? When someone very different from you comes in these doors, or you encounter someone totally opposite of you, maybe they don't have the same of the master's melanin that you do, how do we treat one another? When we got abundant godly love that saturates our soul, we're going to be a changed people. He wants us to have truly, truly these uh, abundant godly love that changes those things. But he, he says, look, I want you to have a, an advanced godly knowledge as well. He said that your, prayer, that your love may abound still more and more, how? In knowledge. He says, I want you to have an advanced godly knowledge as well. He said it will be empowered. He, he, gives us, he gives us more discernment is what he does. That term there, literally, an advanced means to, and knowledge means to have a discerning uh, spirit, to understand between not just right and wrong, but good and best. We have way too many puffed up professors Academians who think they have the answers and it doesn't seem to be making any difference, does it, in our world? See, what we're missing is the true knowledge of God. And he says, I'm praying that as your love abounds, your knowledge, your understanding, your discernment from my perspective, seeing things from my perspective will change. We see things from the world's perspective and everybody and their dog has an opinion, don't they? You don't believe it? Get on Facebook about a half a minute. <laughs> Run your Twitter feed, see what happens. Everybody has an opinion about everything. And like my daddy said, my wise daddy said, everybody's got opinions. They just like armpits. Got a couple of them, and they all stink. <laughs> but we need his knowledge from his perspective. Not a worldly knowledge. And sometimes we get this crazy improper knowledge. Just the wrong, just wrong. And everybody has that opinion and said, well, this is right and this is right. How do we know? How do we know what's right? I mean, I get confused. I, I turn on the television, I get confused. You turn on the radio, you read the stuff. There's just so much information coming at us from so many places. See, when we get the kind of God, knowledge that God wants us to have, it's going to change some things enough. It's going to increase our gratitude to him when we understand things from his perspective. He said, I'm praying you have an abundant godly knowledge. It will increase our gratitude to God. It will also increase our gratitude to other Christians, by the way. You'll be thankful for those who are around you who know you and who know our Lord. It's going to increase your, your, the quality of your life to God and others. It'll increase the supply from God and others. But as we get that knowledge, it gives us the ability to make those decisions between not just good and bad, but between good and best. Isn't it amazing how you got Dr. Phil on television telling you how to do things? You got Oprah telling you how to do things? You got Dora, Dr. Selection, you got these radio hosts telling you how to, and people call in by the millions, oh, help me, help me make a decision. You know, it's funny, but it's sad. My friends, when we have a, an, a truly a saturated soul with God's love and have empowered godly knowledge, we'll be able to make those kind of decisions. And he's given us the book to do it. Discernment. 
He says, he says, I want you to have that knowledge and all discernment. And that's what I've been talking about, that kind of discernment. That word, by the way, discernment is in the original language where it's where we get the word aesthetic. It's almost the uh, transliteration into the English language. And aesthetic means that to, to understand that which is beautiful, to, under, to discern the beauty of something. And when we get God's knowledge, he'll give us discernment to understand which is beautiful in his sight. Well, what's his purpose? Look at verse 10. That's just prayer, but what's the purpose of this prayer? Look at it. Why is he praying this? Why is he asking this for this church? He says that you may approve the things that are excellent. Approve the things that he said literally, and that's where it, it, it follows through with that knowledge and understanding. He says, so that you can approve. And that term there is the one that was used for the, uh, how they determine whether gold or a metal was a pure alloy, it was a pure gold. There's a testing process that went on. He says, you can, he says, I'm wanting you to be able to test this in such a way that you know and understand that it's right, but also that things, what things are excellent. And then he says, look in the next part of that verse. Why? Why does he want you to be able to do that? That you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. He's talking about being able to understand things from his perspective, discern things from his perspective so that you can live out your life on this earth properly and to live according to his word. That you can be sincere and without offense. And he's talking, he said, one, sincerity, that's the idea of inwardly. And the other on the outside, he says, without offense is how you live outwardly, inwardly and outwardly. The word sincere there is a, a unique word. Now, I'm going to tell you the, what the, the literal translation of that word means and what it really, the, how it would be interpreted in that day and how it was used. It literally means to be without wax. And you go, boy, that blesses my heart, Pastor. <laughs> what, what is it without wax? What does that mean? You see, in this particular day, in the setting, People didn't have metal pots and pans like we do today. Nearly all of their vessels, everything they used to cook with or to hold anything, whether it was a grain or a liquid, was made, was, was a, a clay vessel, a, a, like we'd make pots out of today, clay pots. Well, what they would do is they would take clay from the riverbanks and so forth, and they would mold it to the form that they wanted. Let's say it was a, a jar or a pot. Then they would put it in an oven and heat it. Now, during that process, if they heated it too quickly or too slowly, if or it had too much moisture, there were just certain parameters that had to be just right. But if something didn't go exactly right, what would happen when the potter was making his pot there, it would crack. And he really wouldn't know that until he got it out. Now, when the potter got it out and he saw that crack in it, a dishonest potter would do this. He would take that pot and he would take wax and fill in the cracks in the holes. Then he would paint the outside and sell it as whole. But the discerning buyer of the pot that day would take that pot and hold it up to the sun and turn it. And if there was wax in it, the sun would show through it. He says, I want you to be without wax. No cracks. No fakery. No crackpot Christians. <laughs> he said, I want you to be sincere. You're not faking it so that everybody else can see. And they may not be discerning enough, but God is. He said, I want you to be sincere. Don't just dress up and come to church and act like it on Sunday. He said, I want you to live it on Monday. It's not what you say, it's what you do. 
He said, because if you're sincere, and he's talking about the inward part, your heart inwardly, if it, you're sincere and without wax, inwardly, it's going to show up outwardly. He says, notice that he said, you may be sincere inwardly and without offense. That means outwardly. You don't offend. That, that term there, outwardly, it, it, it means not to cause someone to stumble over something, not to cause another to trip, not to be an obstacle. See, if our hearts are pure, we're li- it'll cause us to live in such a way that we are not offending and causing others to fall. The little lady pulled up to the signal, the light signal. It had it turned red and she stopped. And she was probably 70 plus years old. And she saw the light. This gave her an opportunity to reach over into her handbag and to look for some lipstick or something. By the way, men, I've learned long ago, don't go in the handbag. Stay out. You could get lost there or find things that will hurt you. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm telling you, my wife could leave the house today and be gone for two months and never run out of what she needs as long as she's got her purse. That was free. I just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> well, she was digging in her purse and lost track of time, and the light changed. But there was a guy, a young guy pulled up behind her, and he was waiting to go, and and the light had turned green, and she was still digging her purse, and he said, oh, man. And so he starts honking on his horn. And uh, that didn't do any good, and so he gets his head out the window and starts beating on the side door. Hey, lady, come on, move. Uh, About, I mean, this is going on for a while, and uh, she kind of looks up and looks around, and then she looks up, and the light turned red again. (laughs) Well, son, he just went off like a Roman candle. He is upset, <laughs> just honking, beating on the things. And then finally it turns green, and she goes, well, he just takes off right after her, you know. Well, he didn't know, but there was a police officer right behind him. <laughs> now, he, he didn't speed or anything. He just, that officer turned that light on, pulled him over. She got out of the vehicle, walked around to where he was. First thing he said, I didn't do anything wrong. It's not against the law to honk your horn. It's not against the law to yell at somebody. They were just sitting there. Sir, may I have your driver's license registration, please? Well, I didn't do anything wrong. Sir, I just need your driver's license registration, please. He finally gives it to her, and he goes back. Oh, man, she goes back. He's just, oh, he's just fuming. He's banging his steering wheel. Man, I can't believe this stuff pulled me over for her. You know? And <sighs> Finally, she comes back. She has run the plates, run everything, and hands it back to him. He says, I didn't do anything. He says, sir, just calm down a minute. I'm not going to give you a ticket. <sighs> he said, the reason I stopped you was because I saw all those Christian bumper stickers on the back of your car. And I thought the car was stolen by the way you were acting. (laughs) Well, (laughs) you know, I don't even have to say anything else, do I? I'm telling you, when we moved here, it, it came into Detroit. Lord, have mercy. This, I thought NASCAR was down south. No. It's right here on this freeway. Now, how we, how sincere we are. No wax, no fake. It's going to show up in how we don't cause other people to stumble over us. In other words, we're good, godly witnesses. Well, what's our power? Where do we get the power to do this? How are we going to do this? He he tells us in verse 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. 
I have, I have five granddaughters. I don't have any grandsons, all grandgirls. By the way, I only had two boys. You know, reared two boys. Girls are a lot different than boys. Drama, drama, and more drama. I got stories. I can stand up here all day and tell you stories about that, but I'm not going to. I'm just telling you, these are grand girls. <laughs> well, our grand girls, I, I've just learned, step away. <laughs> hand them the wallet. <laughs> They'll be okay. Everything's all right. Well, I, I, we do spoil them because we don't get to see them in all, that often. Two live in Colorado. Two live in Kentucky. I mean, three live in Kentucky. And we get a couple of them from uh, Colorado during the summers. Well, when they come... Sabrina, Grammy, she thinks that they have to have everything at Kroger. In fact, if she does not come home with half the store, I'm surprised. But before those girls come and stay with us in the, in the summertime, she goes to Kroger and just starts buying stuff. Junk food. I mean, junk food. And she'll buy things I, I, I don't want to eat. I just don't. And one of the things that she buys because the granddaughters love them so much are these things called Pop-Tarts. Now, have you ever seen Pop-Tart? That's a piece of cardboard with icing on it. That's, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a shingle with, with sprinkles on it. You know I mean? Well, I, mean, I, I, I look and I said, Sabrina, why did you buy that? The girls like it. Oh, so I, I finally figured out... I, I got one of those Pop-Tarts, and I took it out of the package, and I'm looking at it going, I don't understand. And then I broke it open. It was full of fruit. Oh, how we need more Pop-Tart Christians in our life. That when, when things break us open, nothing but fruit comes out. You see, he says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, that's how it'll work. When all of those people come honking up behind you, when you want to go around them quickly, when you want to be rude, crude, and socially unacceptable, and you don't need to be because you don't want to be a stumbling block to somebody, the only way you can do it is when you are filled with the fruits of righteousness. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Mm. Against such, there is no law. Proverbs tells us the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and, and he who wins souls is wise. That's fruit. So he says, the power of that righteousness will give us the ability to do, to, to do that. And it's through the impartation of Christ. Where does the fruit come from? It comes from the vine. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. There's that, there's that fruit. That's that gets in. Comes in through Jesus. He bears what? Much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Is that not the truth? How are we going to be sincere? How are we going to be non-stumbling? How are we going to have those fruits of righteousness? In him, that's the only way. The answer, folks, is just more Jesus. That's just it. That's the answer. What will happen from that? Did you see what it said in the last part? It says... Uh, the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus, that's what we're looking for. It's in him. What will it result in? Glory and praise to God.
That's where we want to be. All I know is one day when I step into heaven, he says, good job. Good job. That's praise and glory to him. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Therefore, whatever, we, whatever you eat or whatever you do, you do it all to the glory of God. See, that's what we've been predestined for. It tells us in Ephesians, it's to the praise and the glory of his grace. That's a pretty good prayer. And that's the prayer that we should be praying not only for ourselves, but for our church, for your pastor, the leaders, that God would be glorified here, right here, middle bell. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the attentiveness of your people. Pray, God. Your word, as you promised, will not come back empty. But, Lord, it will accomplish all that it's set out to do. And God, may we be the kind of church and people that all around look and say, those people truly love you. And it will be evident in the way we live, how we talk, how, how, how we walk, how, how we don't cause others to turn from you, but cause others to seek you. Lord Jesus, may you be truly glorified with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.